Starbucks has grown from a modest Seattle coffee shop to the corporate behemoth recognizable to people from every corner of the earth. What may seem like a simple staple of our day-to-day -day lives is actually a complex organization with a vivid history and a host of bizarre quirks. Starbucks fans have three people to thank for bringing the company into the world. The first is Gordon Boker, a college dropout from Seattle who had discovered his love of coffee on a trip to Italy in 1962. The other two were Boker's roommates, Jerry Baldwin and Zev Siegel. Spurred on by their love of good coffee, they began roasting their own and eventually they started a company and named it Starbucks. This early iteration of the legendary coffee shop sold coffee beans, tea, spices, coffee machines and accessories. It wasn't until years later that they began to sell actual coffee drinks. Boker, Baldwin and Siegel didn't stay with Starbucks forever. In the 80s, a young salesman named Howard Schultz bought out the company and turned it into the coffee juggernaut it is today. The site of the original Starbucks is something of a place of pilgrimage for coffee fans, even today. The famous tourist spot, however, is actually the store's second location, where it moved to in 1977. Nonetheless, it constitutes a must-visit for visitors to Seattle from all around the world. The store isn't much different to how it was back in the 70s. It's a small building, and there's nowhere to sit or hang out inside. A strange remnant of the company's original operation is a place to buy coffee beans and accessories rather than drink coffee. That's not to say they haven't modernized at all, though. And you can now buy coffee drinks at the original store, which actually offers everything you'd find in any other modern Starbucks branch. In fact, to a passing observer, the only thing that would really give any indication as to the store's long and hollowed history are the strange, barely recognizable logos emblazoned around the room. Nowadays, nobody puts much thought into what the name Starbucks could possibly mean. And why would they? After all, everybody knows it's the name of a coffee shop. Once upon a time, however, the name might have seemed a little peculiar, and that's because it finds its origins in a very specific place. The founders of Starbucks took the name from Moby Dick, the legendary novel by Herman Melville. In the book, Starbuck is the name of the first mate of the Pequod, Captain Ahab's ship, and provides a calm contrast to the obsessive nature of Ahab. Starbucks, however, was actually a second-choice name for the company. Gordon Boker had actually wanted to call the company Pequod, but Boker's marketing partner Terry Heckler was unconvinced. Eventually, the two settled on Starbucks. The Starbucks logo is one of the most iconic in corporate history. Few can quite match the sheer recognizability of that white mermaid on her green background, but that wasn't quite always the Starbucks logo. The original logo, which is still plastered all over that early Seattle branch, is actually brown and depicted the mermaid as topless. The idea was that the two-tailed mermaid, who was based on an image found on a 16th century woodcut, was supposed to appear as seductive as the coffee itself. Naturally, complaints were made, but Starbucks didn't see a problem until they reached the point at which the logo needed to appear on the side of delivery trucks. The logo was redesigned, and the mermaid was given her modesty along with a new hairstyle. The legendary, modern icon was born. Yep, it's that classic Starbucks aroma. In his 1997 book, Pour Your Heart Into It, Howard Schultz describes it as, quote, heady, rich, full-bodied, dark, suggestive. However you want to describe it, it's one of the defining features of Starbucks' image and pervades practically every Starbucks store across the planet. But keeping that smell going strong is hard work for the company. Coffee beans tend to absorb odors, meaning it's easy for them to be ruined by contaminant smells. To prevent this from happening, Starbucks banned smoking in their stores long before it became the law. They also don't allow their employees to use perfumes and colognes and refuse to sell chemically flavored coffee beans. Strong-smelling goods such as soup, pastrami, and other foods are also off the menu. And what results is one pure, simple smell — coffee. Frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. The classic green staff apron is practically as recognizable to Starbucks customers as the logo itself, but it's not the only one that exists. In fact, there's a whole range of other aprons which all have their own individual meanings and purposes. The green apron is standard, of course. Military vets and their spouses have the option of wearing one embroidered with an American flag, while staff members who've graduated from the Starbucks College Achievement Plan have one embroidered with a mortar board. Orange aprons are worn in the Netherlands to celebrate King's Day, while the purple apron is saved exclusively for each year's 26 barista champions. The black apron, meanwhile, is worn by coffee masters, who have certified knowledge in the field. Occasionally, promotional events will involve the company giving out a few special aprons to each store, such as the pale blue apron for the launch of Frappuccino Happy Hour, or the red aprons you might see during the holidays. 
The apron isn't the only item on the Starbucks dress code worth a look. In fact, the company is actually pretty strict on how it allows employees to present themselves. Here's a run-through of the rules. Hair must be kept looking natural, meaning no bright colors such as purple, pink, blue, or green, although this can vary by store. Rings are allowed, but only if they have no stones and watches. Bracelets and wristbands are forbidden for food safety reasons. The apron must be kept clean, unwrinkled, and unstained, and its preferred shirts be tucked in. Piercings should be small, fingernails clean, and tattoos are allowed, as long as they are tasteful and not on the face or throat. Finally, any hats worn must have the Starbucks logo, and pants, shorts, or skirts should be khaki or black. On the no-go list, blue jeans, hoodies, t-shirts, yoga pants, cowboy boots, canvas shoes, and of course, colognes and perfumes. Starbucks' round tables exist at pretty much every location the company owns, and they're built that way for a very good reason. According to Karen Blumenthal, author of Grande Expectations, A Year in the Life of Starbucks Stock, the store's round tables are made that way to make you feel less lonely and more at home. She wrote, Round tables are more welcoming than those with square edges, and people look less alone while seated at a round table. It just goes to show that even the most innocuous characteristics of stores like Starbucks have been thought through over and over again, because making it all about the experience is definitely one way to keep people coming back and deciding to stay long enough to get a second coffee. You're probably well aware of Starbucks cup sizes. You've got the tall, the grande, and the venti, sure. But did you know that there are some other cup sizes which, despite not appearing on the menu, are available to Starbucks customers? Venti's the only one that doesn't mean large. It's also the only one that's Italian. Congratulations, you're stupid in three languages. The first is the short, which was one of the two original cup sizes sold by the company. It's only eight ounces and constitutes the smallest drink size that Starbucks offers, despite being a fairly regular size for homemade coffee. Another is the Trenta, a newish drink size that measures in at a whopping 31 ounces. It's only available for iced drinks such as iced coffee, iced tea, lemonade, and other cold drinks, and usually costs 50 cents more than the venti size. But honestly, do you really need it? And FYI, it's called a venti because it's 20 ounces. 20! Venti! Of all the Starbucks locations around the world, however, perhaps most curious of all is that which exists deep inside the CIA's headquarters at Langley in Virginia. Known affectionately as Stealthy Starbucks, the baristas who work at that branch are put through a wide array of background checks and interviews before they're allowed to work there. And even after getting through all that, they're escorted by agents in and out of their work area. Despite its clandestine nature, however, the Langley branch is one of the busiest in the USA and serves thousands of analysts, agents, economists, engineers, geographers, and cartographers every day. The purpose of this top-secret Starbucks is to provide a humanizing environment for agency workers, many of whom work in high-pressure scenarios and don't have their smartphones to help them tune out, because they have to leave those in their cars. It also provides a setting for job interviews for current agents looking to get reassigned. And no, before you ask, nobody gives their name at the counter. Back in 2007, Starbucks and Concord Music Group co-founded Hear Music, the company's very own record label. It had gotten into the music business by selling the music of artists such as Ray Charles and Bob Dylan in stores across America. That same year, however, it made its first proper signing, Paul McCartney. McCartney had spent his entire career, including his time as a Beatle, at EMI, save for a brief foray into working with Columbia Records in the 80s. The label itself didn't go far, though. After signing a smattering of artists that included Carly Simon, they turned over management of the label to the Concord Music Group. They continued to sell CDs until 2015. If there's one thing everyone knows about Starbucks, it's that they're everywhere. Seriously, there's a good chance you can probably see one right now, and if you can't, there's probably one right around the corner. The sheer scale of Starbucks' worldwide domination was put into context by the website Quartz in 2014. Their mapping of the chain across the world found that Starbucks existed in 63 countries, with notable absences in Africa, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe. They also found that the distribution of Starbucks in cities mirrors the shape of the cities themselves, demonstrating the sheer expanse of the stores across each. Quartz also found that Seoul had the most Starbucks at the time, closely followed by New York, Shanghai, London, and Chicago. They also found that if you travel from Boston to NYC to Philadelphia, you'll never be more than 10 miles of a Starbucks. And you could continue down to Baltimore, Washington, Richmond, and Virginia.
and only be more than 10 miles away twice. So yeah, lots of Starbucks. Hate to break it to you menu hackers, but the so-called secret menu at Starbucks isn't actually a thing. Sure, there are entire websites dedicated to keeping track of the latest and greatest Starbucks secret menu items, but just because you see something on the internet doesn't mean it's true. A good reminder in general, really. The whole purpose of places like Starbucks is for people with no decision-making ability That's whatsoever good. to make six decisions just to buy one cup of coffee. Baristas have spoken a lot about the growing trend of customers waltzing up to the counter and ordering some bizarrely named drink, and why it can be a problem. At the heart of it all? Websites that give a fancy concoction a fancy name and forget to tell readers that this secret menu isn't an official thing. In other words, you can definitely order a cotton candy, unicorn dust, golden frappuccino, but your barista will likely have no idea what goes into it. Christine, a barista from Colorado, advises, just make sure you bring in the recipe, because if it's off the secret menu, then we probably don't know how to make it. You know, because the secret menu doesn't really exist. Sorry. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more MASH videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.